Welcome to People in Profit. I'm Kate Moody. Coming up, the U.S. economy is teetering on the verge of recession. But does that definition really matter? And what does it mean for households and businesses? A policy U-turn after a week of market mayhem. We look at the U.K.'s current tax system and how it compares to other economies. And is organic farming inflation-proof or at least resistant? Our correspondents in Austria dig into the industry and how it's weathering the cost of living crisis. The outlook for the global economy is darkening. With slowing economic growth, persistently high inflation and tightening monetary policy, and warnings across the board of a possible worldwide recession. Most forecasts expect the United States to officially be in recession by the end of this year. GDP in the world's largest economy contracted by 1.6 and 0.6 percent in the first and second quarters of 2022. But in the U.S., a recession isn't automatically two consecutive quarters of negative growth. It has to be officially designated by the National Bureau of Economic Research, which has yet to do so. Let's speak to Steve Hankey, professor of applied economics at Johns Hopkins University. He previously served on President Ronald Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. Thanks for being with us on the show today. Economic activity in the U.S. contracted in both the first and second quarters. So why hasn't it been declared a recession? What other factors are at play? It depends on who's making the call. Usually the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, has a business cycle group that makes a determination about what is and is not a recession. And that usually takes about a year after the event actually occurs. So we just have to wait for really the, the official statement will come from the National Bureau of Economic Research. And, and that, that's the kind of gold standard. I think we're going slower, slower, and we could really have what I call a whopper of a recession in 2023. The, the window is kind of October right now until October of 2023. We'll see some heavy weakness occurring in that window. Does the definition of recession really matter? Does having that official label affect American households and businesses differently? It matters politically because the R word Recession is, is a bad word politically. You, you don't want to be in a recession for political reasons. But in reality, it doesn't really make any difference to normal people what, or businesses. What's going on in the economy is real. And whether, whether you call it a recession or not is kind of irrelevant. The question is, is, is your business doing well or doing poorly? Or are the jobs available or not available? Is inflation uh, accompanying that recession, by the way? And, and now I think what we're going to have is not only a, a big slowdown and end what will be determined to be a, an official recession in 2023, but that will be accompanied by inflation. John Greenwood and I have looked at this very carefully, and we used the quantity theory of money a year and a half ago to predict where we would be now in inflation. And we said we would be between 6 and 9%. Well, we're at 8.3. So the quantity theory of money was a tried and true method, and it worked. Now, using that same quantity theory of money, we say by the end of this year, we'll be between 6 and 8%. And by the end of 2023, we'll be around 5% inflation. So if you combine that high inflation number over double the inflation target of the Fed of 2% by the end of 2023 and of a, a recession, that's called stagflation. That's, that's even a worse word than the R word. And the S word is really bad because you've got both inflation and a recession. Now, the U.S. Federal Reserve has been tightening its monetary policy, raising interest rates to try and tame this inflation. What is the central bank's role in this kind of a situation? And do you think it's doing a good job? The central bank's role is, is a central role because they, they are in charge of the, mon of, of the monetary policy. And the monetary policy revolves around the growth rate in the money supply. That is the key, not, not interest rates. Inter interest rates 
may or may not affect the money supply. You, you have to look at the money supply directly. And the Fed is doing a black, bad job because they don't have the money supply on their dashboard. They're not looking at the money supply. They've canceled the money supply. In fact, Fed Chairman Powell has repeatedly said that the money supply is, has nothing to do with their monetary policy because it has nothing to do with economic activity, which is a ridiculous statement. So they're, they're flying blind at the Fed. They don't know what they're doing. They're not looking at the money supply. All right. Steve Hanke, professor at Johns Hopkins University, thanks so much for joining us on People and Profit today. Well, on September the 23rd, the UK government detailed a mini budget that included 45 billion pounds worth of tax cuts, purportedly aimed at helping households deal with inflation. It included a plan to scrap the 45 percent tax rate on the highest earners, and it was not accompanied by an economic forecast. The proposals sent the pound sterling plummeting, prompted emergency intervention by the Bank of England and hit approval ratings for the new prime minister. Just 10 days after the initial announcement, facing mayhem on the markets and growing pressure from both within and outside the Conservative Party, British Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng backtracked on cutting that top tax rate. I know the plan put forward only 10 year, uh, days ago has caused a little turbulence. I get it. I get it. Uh, we are listening and have listened. And now I want to focus on delivering the major parts of our growth package. Charles Pelligan is here with more. Talk us through the different brackets for income tax in the UK. Well, Kate, uh, the United Kingdom has a fairly simple income tax system divided into four brackets. All annual income above £12,570, around €14,000, is taxed. First at a basic rate of 20%, and then for earners of above £50,000 at the high rate of 40%. And finally, for those who make over £150,000 at a rate of 45%. That's the bracket that Kwasi Kwarteng decided not to scrap in the end, a top rate which had already been brought down from 50% by David Cameron in 2013. And starting in April, however, the basic rate will be lowered from 20 to 19% a year earlier than scheduled. What about businesses? How are they taxed in the UK? Well, the corporation tax, which is uh, taken on a company's profits, is set at 19% across the board, no matter the size of the company. There is one exception, those so-called ring fence companies who make their profits from oil rights or extraction. These have a special rate of 30%. During the pandemic, the then-government announced a planned hike of the corporation tax to 25% for the country's most profitable companies. But with the change of leadership and the arrival of Liz Truss, that hike has been cancelled in her bid to make the UK a low-tax and a high-growth economy. So how does the UK's taxation system compare to other economies? Well, Liz Truss uh, says that she aims for more simplicity in the income tax system, but the UK already has fewer tax brackets than the US or France, for instance. In terms of top income tax rates, the UK's 45% rate is lower than most other major European economies and Japan, but still higher than the top US rate of 43.7%. And when it comes to corporate tax, the UK has one of the lowest among developed countries, even below 21% in the US. All of this means the government brings in less tax revenue than a dozen European countries including France and Germany, with a tax burden at 34.4% of GDP. Charles Pellegrin, thanks so much for that update. Well, food prices are soaring around the world, in part because of a global disruption in supplies of fertilizers. But the cost of organic produce, grown without chemical fertilizer or pesticides, is rising at a significantly slower pace. Despite higher prices, demand remains strong. Austria is the European leader in organic agriculture. Our correspondents Vianney Laurent and Anthony Mills have this report. In the federal state of Salzburg in the west of Austria, more than half of all agricultural land is devoted to organic farming. Ulrike Gangel has been producing milk and raising geese for more than 15 years. She remains confident in the face of rising prices. In the current situation, organic farming is doing a bit better than regular agriculture because we don't use chemical fertilizer and we don't have to import pesticides or feed. 
For the products we sell ourselves, we've only had to raise prices 2 or 3 percent. Meat, for example, to keep revenue steady. The cost of organic food has risen at a slower pace than standard produce, meaning there's a shrinking price gap in shops. Analysts say that's likely to spur demand for organic options. In 2021, 11 percent of supermarket sales across Austria were organic food. We expect this development to continue and reach 15 percent. Players within the sector argue this shows that organic farming is the future of agriculture, stable and resistant to crises. But for now, it's not enough to feed the country. To increase the share of organic agriculture and overall food output, we need to significantly reduce meat consumption, especially pork. And we have to do research to address the difference in yield compared to conventional agriculture, as well as significantly reduce food waste. The Austrian government is supporting the industry, with a plan to serve 55 percent organic food in canteens for public sector workers by 2030. That's all for now. Don't forget you can find this and our previous shows on the France 24 website or as a podcast wherever you usually listen. You can also get in touch with your comments and questions on social media. Until next time, thanks for watching. France 24, your economy explained. Liberté, égalité, actualité.